MCC TV is largely about what happens in the classrooms here at Metropolitan Community College. Our mission, of course, to inform you about all the educational opportunities the college provides. But we also chat with speakers, authors, and performers who visit our campuses. And once per quarter, we sit down with the president and CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce for a chat about the cultural, social, and economic health and development of our viewing area. I'm Kent Pavelka, your host. Our conversation ahead is about what happened in the third quarter. David Brown joins us next. Okay, David, another three months in the books and time to recap what happened in the third quarter of 2019. Here we go again. Yeah, here we go again. <laughs> Off the top of your head before we get into the nuts and bolts of it, what are the top three or four things that pop into your head about the third quarter or the year to date? Is the Blueprint Nebraska kind of made their announcement about um, what their strategy was looking like and, and how that we needed to move forward as a state in developing and retaining and attracting talent in building our communities so they're places that people really want to live and grow in and growing our economy so that it has a set of uh, diverse uh, types of industries that have careers that excite people who want, who want to be here. So I think um, if you add that to the notion that they also focus really good attention on the fact that our population is really gonna be changing in the state um, over the next uh, 20 years that we're now maybe 25 percent or so um, non-white population and I know in this region will be by 2040 will be probably a majority non-white population so big difference in what our demographics look like and so what does that mean for our schools and for our businesses etc so that's that was a a big piece of work that has really gone on for the last 18 months to two years so to get that strategy out there and then start building the implementation strategy was a big deal um, we had our own diver our first diversity, equity, and inclusion conference, the Code Conference, so-called. Um, sold out, 460 plus people attended. Uh, it was a, as you would expect, a very diverse crowd, probably the most diverse crowd that uh, we've ever seen at a chamber event. Um, and we learned, a, we're all trying to figure out what this diversity, equity, and inclusion thing means, both for employers as well as for the community. So that, that was a big deal. Um, Economic development, we had a couple of kind of big brand name successes. Uh, you know, Google comes to mind right away that they um, finally announced their project and we had a big uh, groundbreaking ceremony, ribbon cutting ceremony over there. So that, that, was, that was pretty good. So I, mean, I think it's been, a, it was a really robust summer and early fall and um, lots of stuff going on to lead us into the next quarter. Very good. Blueprint Nebraska, What take us back. Who all's involved in that? And then, uh, you kind of outlined what what the discussion was about, but um, anything you focused in on in terms of an action plan, or is that yeah. premature? Well, th th there were actually several. Well, let me answer the first part of the question first. Uh, back three or four years ago, um, Hank Bounds, the then president of University of Nebraska, um, came to us with a notion of what they had done when he w was in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And it's about the creation of a, a statewide economic development strategy. And we've been bouncing around the idea about what would one such a thing look like. Um, Hank brought to us sort of a model that had worked there. And so basically we created a, a steering committee made up of 23 business leaders in the state with input from the university and from the governor's office um, with the intent of trying to figure out what we could do over the next 20 years to uh, make Nebraska a more vibrant place for people to live, work, and play. And, and, so, and it was the, the compilation of this group that kind of made yes. it unique? Yeah, it, it was number one, it was really business driven with support from state government and the university. And that was important because you know the business community tends to look at things maybe differently than academia or government. And while some of the recommendations that were made by the committees um, were, uh, it would impact government or academia, um, we felt that there needed to be a real focus on what the business community thought we could we could get done. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I got a bias on that being a chamber of commerce guy. I a think little bit. That, I think the business community can can be the the fountain of a lot of wisdom. And then we had 17 different industry councils that were formed, that looked at everything from agriculture to transportation to healthcare to um, communications technology to uh, downtown development to um, 
diversity and inclusion to talent development, attraction and retention, I mean, 17 different groups of business people and other professionals who worked for months really to put together these plans. And then um, the steering committee with the help of a couple consultants weaned all of those down into a set of five or six uh, broader goals um, that could kind of point us in the direction that we need to go in. And so, um, as an example, th there is a strong recommendation that there needs to be a um, significant look at a comprehensive tax reform strategy in the state of Nebraska. That includes not just property taxes and not just income taxes, but looks at sales taxes, looks at user fees, uh, looks at virtually all the ways that money comes into government in the state of Nebraska and is used to provide services and to see how we can be more competitive because right now we are getting by by the year getting less and less competitive in our rates compared to other states we compete with so there was a a, a plan kind of put forward recently that said here's the process we're going to go through to see what a tax reform strategy could look like and they'll do that for each of the major goals and objectives that came out of the plan mm -hmm. so Big deal. It was chaired by Lance Fritz, the CEO of UP, and um, Owen Palm, who is the CEO of 21st Century Industries in Scotts Bluff. And then the business people that were on this were all walks of life from across the state, lots of different kinds of businesses, and just about every geographic subsection you can think of. It's almost mind-boggling to come up with uh, to, to to envision how the entire state's interests could be, you know. Uh, you could folk, you could you could funnel that down to four or five things because it, yeah. the state's so different from, from border to border. Although some of those things impact all of us, so whatever taxes we pay impacts everybody across the state. Now they may have different impacts, but nonetheless, you've got to be able to generate enough um, tax revenue to pay for services. So how do we do that? Mm -hmm. um, Education is important across the state. So what do we expect our education system to do in in our market? the challenges are different than the challenges that might be out in greater Nebraska. And you know, we have a- I guess a, that's my point. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and so you've got to have representation of all those different entities on this group and then a recognition that any solution is not going to be simple. It's going to be right. complex that reflects the needs of the whole state. So whether it's, I mean, you can write down the list of all the things I mentioned, the transportation needs in parts of Nebraska are different than transportation needs in other parts of Nebraska. The same with education, the same with politics, the same with tax reform, the same with services, the same with culture and amenities, lots of differences. And that was probably one of the biggest uh, conclusions that the, that the consultants drew, is that we have a, a very large state geographically. Um, it is divided really pretty aggressively in urban and rural sort of uh, interests, <laughs> interests and, and even geographies. Um, and um, it also has a bunch of sub-interests you know, that relate to what people do for a living or if they want to live in a small town or a suburbia or a large town. And we had to reflect all of those things in the strategy. So for someone like me, that, that's a fascinating conversation. About well, how did, how, did the, how did it differ from other conversations you, you've been involved with over the years? Well, in almost every case, the, there, there has been a um, a, a narrowing of the topic. So it might be we're only going to study transportation statewide. Okay, so it's a very narrow topic. Um, and typically it is uh, being delivered for a very specific reason, trying to accomplish a political out outcome, trying to accomplish a uh, public relations outcome, something that says I'm, I'm doing this study because I want to have this very specific issue resolved. Right. This yeah. had none, none of that attached to it. This basically said, who is Nebraska, what is Nebraska, what does Nebraska want to be, and can we all kind of roll up our sleeves and try and figure out something that will benefit everybody in the state. So the end result wasn't in, in mind when you went into this You're thing. You're absolutely right. So what is the end result? Well, frankly, we don't have time on this show to walk through it, but you can go to, to blueprintnebraska.com, okay. and the entire report is there. And you can find out all the subsets and all the different council members, and you can see an awful lot of information there. Was one of the conclusions, what are you going to do next with this? Yeah, well, so the, the big challenge when they announced it was, okay, this is, the study's been done. And the very first question was, okay, when, when does implementation start? Yeah. And so there's money being raised right now, and there are, some of the committees are um, more aggressive about putting kind of an implementation strategy together. In some cases, it might be, 
uh, looking at an existing organization and saying, will you take this on, rather than us doing something separate and independent of that. In other cases where there might not be an existing organization that can do the work, we'll have to build a coalition of folks from across the state to make those things happen. So that implementation strategy is being crafted right now. Well, let's focus on the greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce sure. area. Um, Third quarter, uh, the numbers, economic numbers. Yeah, project pipeline continues to be really strong. I think we have 51 new prospects, you know, come our way in the third quarter. Um, we had about 75 or so um, visits to existing companies, which you know generates a good number of our projects for us. Um, we had seven companies come visit us in the third quarter, uh, which is a, a good strong number. And you know, we've year to date, I think we've had 32 companies come and visit us. So it, it's been a, a a good mix and if you think about our mix of projects they tend to be about half of them are new companies to the market and about half of them are expansion projects so I think these numbers kind of reflect that. Yeah, what, 74, 75 business retention, ex expansion? Yeah, and so you have to go call on companies. And you know, basically, we would go call on ABC Inc. and say, wow, what's going on? Tell me about your business. Are there things that we can be doing differently to make your business more profitable? What are your challenges that we can, might be able to help you solve? Or are they similar to the macro challenges that we're trying to deal with in the community? And oh, by the way, are you thinking about expanding? Or even worse, are you... Do you have a, a challenge in trying to stay open, or are you thinking about expanding in another market or going to another market? How can we forestall those things from happening? When we talk numbers, what's the most important number of the year? The investment numbers, or you know, it used to be, but investment numbers get skewed when you have one great big project, and it seems like every year now we have at least one big data center project that skews the numbers. So you know, we have a goal of six hundred million dollars a year in capital investment and you do one data center project, and you could double that in one project. So, And then everybody expects the same next year, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and we've been fortunate that we've been able to land these great big data center projects over the last several years. Um, you know, I think, th I think the, the job number and the wage number, so we've, we modified our, our uh, measurements a lot going into this next five-year cycle and realized that maybe we're not going to have as robust of job creation as we had before. Um, but mostly that's reflective of the tight talent pool that we have here and that companies are, are not going to be able to grow maybe as fast as they would have liked to because we just don't have some of the talent that they need. But the other part of it is that when we, if we're going to be out there being really aggressive recruiting companies and jobs here, uh, we're going out, going out after a lot higher paying jobs, so the minimum being around $50,000 a year. So for us that means that if, I can, if we can do... 2,000 jobs in a year, and the average wage for those are 50,000 plus. We've had a bigger impact on the community than if we had done 2,000 jobs, and the average wage was $38,000 a year. Well, that gets back to who you recruit and and, and the, you know what what companies expand, right? Right. right. And and it also get, gets to the the role that startups play in in this mix. I mean, they're they're included in our, in our year end numbers. We have a goal of of 50 new tech startups a year um, over the next five years. Tech startups tend to uh, pay pretty good wages. As a matter of fact, they tend to pay higher wages than average. Um, they're creating anywhere from, say, three to 15 jobs, so they definitely are small startups. But if they grow over the next few years to the scale of, say, a, a flywheel, which is growing, or a toast, which is growing here, or a huddle, or a Nelnet, or a builder trend, all of a sudden you've got large tech companies that are paying really good money and hiring tech-based people who can be really successful here. So we think that's a target that we should be paying attention to. Are we ahead of the curve in terms of focus on on, on developing tech as a, as a big part of what we are? You know, I, I think we, we are ahead of the curve if you compare Omaha to Omaha. There you go. Okay. Um, the past. Yeah, I mean, if you think about what we did, even I got here 16 years ago, and our main target was kind of manufacturing, warehousing, logistics. That was where we were spending a lot of time. Then we got into military and defense contracting mm -hmm. because of the U.S. Space Command coming We've been here. doing this show too long because I remember us talking yeah, about yeah. <laughs> Those are all, yeah. and the targets have, have, have shifted over the years. I mean, yeah. so this data center is a direct, the data center success we've had is a direct result of the technology that's in the ground. Sure. Um, and so broadband has made a huge difference and having you know, um, multiple fiber options makes a huge difference. Um, medicine has become, has always been big, but it's become so much bigger. Um, 
telecommunications was always big, but that is now converted into this whole big technology piece because telecommunications is now more than just telephone systems and 1-800 calls and call centers. Now it's all the stuff downstream from those, all the financial service companies that are here, um, the, the pay companies like PayPal and the, uh, frankly, all the financial services and fintech stuff we're doing here. The insurance industry continues to be a big part of that financial services mm -hmm. piece. So there, there's a really interesting collection of industries here now, six pretty significant um, clusters that uh, make us much more diverse as an economy than a lot of places. So we don't see that the economic vagaries happen in our job and unemployment rate going up and down pretty dramatically. It's pretty steady, but pretty steady also means it's not growing real fast. Right. And we need to have it grow faster because it'll attract more people, which means our population will grow faster, which is what we need. What, what, can, uh, what, what kinds of developments can happen to make it grow faster? Well, we, we think that place has a big, um, as a big, uh, is a big issue for um, keeping and retaining and attracting talent. Our culture. Yeah, so, so it is about the amenities that are here. So think riverfront development, what that 90-acre um, huge project is going to look like from 15th Street all the way down to the river and then the riverfront. Um, what, what is that going to mean as a, as a new a cool project in downtown. What will the kind of agri campus mean? Well, look at what the difference Midtown Crossing has made and the difference that Exarban Village has made. And now you can go to the Boys Town project and all the way out to 192nd Street for really a significant investment. Those are all projects that make it easier for people to make a decision to live here and work here. Yeah. And then if you start thinking about all the cultural investments that we've made, the the growth of our food industries here, the, the continued growth in, in music and art and culture, um, the ability still to get around here in a reasonable amount of time, the fact you can still buy a house for a reasonable price and um, pretty close to where you work. I mean, those are all quality of life things that, yeah. that we may take for granted some days, but the people who are trying to consider where they're going to live coming from the outside don't take those things for granted. And not only the people who are, going, who are deciding where they want to live, but companies that decide where they want to locate. I mean, this yeah. is competition, right? You've got to, yeah. you've got to have these things. And it, it is funny to me that it does come down to companies wanting to be in a place that they can be proud of. But it also really comes down to those companies saying, well, if I can be proud of it, does that mean I can attract the talent here that I need? Right. I mean, it, 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 talent is driving the economic development cycle here in ways that it never has before. <clears throat> There's unemployment, low unemployment all around the country. And um, it's starting to impact every business's decision about where they're going to invest their dollars. And so we've got to show that we can not only develop talent along pipelines that reflect the kind of industries we want here, but that we can retain talent right. here because people want to live here and that we can attract talent because they want the kind of jobs that are here in a kind of quality community. So it, it is really interesting how place impacts our ability to have the talent pool that we need here. Which gets us back to Blueprint Nebraska to it a does. certain extent. Yeah. No, um, it does. Talk a little bit about the uh, transportation work in urban core, what, the Connect Go. Yeah, so part of this about place, as an example. Um, when we started doing our young professional survey years and years ago, um, we always were asking the question, so what, what kind of a place are you looking for? If, if you're thinking about coming here, or, or excuse me, staying here, and or even trying to convince your friends and relatives to come here and, and live here and have jobs, what kind of a place do we need to have? And so every time we do this survey every couple of years, we, we get this kind of continual stream of, we want to have a community that is, that's got great culture, that's got great access to amenities, that's got great food, that's got great um, transportation. transportation and all these <laughs> things. And then you start saying, okay, what do you mean by all that? And transportation means a choice. We saw a survey the other day that 80% of the folks in Omaha um, drive themselves to work every day. And you can feel that at rush hour when people are going to and from work. Um, so if folks want a choice, if they want to live in a place where they can choose not to take a car to work, can we meet that choice? And right now the answer is really no, right, we can't. Right. Um, similarly, people want to have a place that uh, if they leave here, the vast majority of them go to a larger market a Kansas City, a Denver, a uh, Minneapolis, mm -hmm. one of those. And you ask them what they, what they see there, they don't see here. Well, a lot of it is about the, the environment they can live in. They, if they choose to live in a dense urban environment, they really don't have that choice here. 
And then the, in the big picture of this, if you think about how those kinds of urban places develop in cities, um, they almost never do it organically in, in cities the size of, of Omaha. They might do it in great big cities where all the tall buildings locate near each other and people all live near those tall buildings and so you create this this dense environment that have transportation options, grocery options, food options, everything you need within walking distance. Right. For a mid-sized city that is unusual, particularly in the Midwest where we're used to driving our cars. And so, so are you saying we need to do that ahead yeah. of time to, cr to create that? Yeah, so we've got an urban core committee that we've created that is um, focused on 10th Street to Saddle Creek and from uh, Cumming Street to Leavenworth, thinking that that really is where some of the, the densest development can take place here. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to create that kind of a neighborhood, what's it got to have? Right. Okay, tall buildings, we got some of those, we need more. Jobs, we got some of those, we need more. Um, walkable places. We got some of those. We need more. Yep. Restaurants got plenty of those. Bars got a lot of those. Maybe we need to have more more diversity and choice, but we got a lot of them. Um, ways for people to get around town without a car. Yeah, not so much. Mm -mm. Um, if you're going to live in the downtown area, other places to live. Yeah, but you got to have a place to park your car, mm -hmm. and you got to take your car everywhere because the, the the mix of amenities that currently are there for downtown living isn't as robust as we think it probably needs to be. So we're building a strategy now about how do we make all of that stuff happen in this downtown area, and not the least of which is how do we provide a transit option for people who don't want to drive. Wouldn't you love to be around 50 years from now, 75 years from now, and see how some of all this that you do, you know, week in, week out, year after year, yeah. uh, you know, ends up being reality or, or doesn't? You know, the, the irony, yes, I, I would love to see that. Um, what we, we have a, this really interesting experiment that has worked remarkably well here in this community, and that's Exarban Village. You bet. It, it, I mean, people remember that was a racetrack. Even when I got here 16 years ago, it was still a, a, a remnants, remnants of a, a racetrack. Mm -hmm. And today, it is arguably one of the most vibrant places in the community, basically a village within the city that has shopping, it has housing, it has places to work, it has places to eat, it has places to drink, it has places to recreate. I mean, it has become this really interesting center. And so, you know, for, for a lot of us, you're driving by either Midtown Crossing or Exarban Village, and knowing what it was like 10 or 15 years ago, it's pretty gratifying, not just because we had anything to do with it, because you can actually see some of these yeah. plans and policies actually come to fruition. and. We can learn from whatever mistakes we made doing those mm -hmm. in making our next to accelerate next right. more of it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the urban core work we're doing here might be the most impactful stuff, aside from the diversity and inclusion work we're doing. Might be the, some of the most long-term impactful stuff that we're we're working on. Very cool. Um, I'm going to throw out a couple things here before we run out of time. Yeah. Uh, you had the economic outlook luncheon in November. Um, keynote by. Is it Amy? Amy Liu, Amy with Liu. the Brookings Institution. She's, she is a real thought leader in the country, and frankly, we're, we're, she is normally sort of annual meeting fodder. I mean, she's, she's an upper-level speaker, and the fact we could get she's her on the, the circuit. economic out. Well, <laughs> she, she is, but, I mean, you see, you see her stuff in The Atlantic and in The Wall Street Journal and New York Times. I mean, she's, she is a, a, an authority on um, equity, economic development, and community development. So her, her topic is perfect for what we're trying to you get bet. done here. So it's a uh, it's great that we were able to bring her to town. Yeah, um, some new rankings. Looks yeah, like looks like we're rankings. number eight, number eight, number five, number eight in best places to live to save money. Yeah, that, that has, that's reflective of some of the, the benefits we have from a cost of living perspective, right? Yeah, so, yeah, a bit cheaper. Yeah, uh, the cost of dining out, medium median in household in household income all come into play there. Yeah, this is. Uh, I don't know who did that one. Um, you know, there are so many now that do there. do from their either they're internet based, they're social media based, or in some cases, you know, they're big think tank based. But um, it's always nice to be in the top ten. Uh, you know, I'm I'm all about first, best, most, and only. And um, <laughs> if, if we can continue to grow that list, that's a good thing. Uh, number eight in places where it takes the least time to move from being a renter to a homeowner. That's important. That is interesting because I think we we find that the um, the amount of money people are paying for rent is closely approximates what it would cost them to have a mortgage. Um, now, what we're also finding is that the 
depending upon your, your price range, um, the housing market has been rid ridiculously robust um, in that sub 250,000 mm -hmm. house range. And so not a lot of those available, um, but um, you know, it, it is interesting to see what percentage of our population now is, is owning rather than renting. And I think we're seeing a huge influx of people that are willing to rent by virtue of all the apartments that are being built around here. Uh, and particularly in the more urban area, you're, you're seeing a lot of, of people that are pretty content to continue renting. Yeah. Well, you got to take a lot of things into consideration, you know. Um, it's becoming more appealing to, I think, retirees, too. It is. You know, I'm, I'm not quite there yet, but every time I got to pull out the it. snowblower or yeah. the, the lawnmower, I'm thinking, there, there's got to be somebody else that can do this for me. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I guess it, it, the, the bottom line with that is it takes about four years on average in our community to, if you want to, if to, you want to, to, to become a homeowner. Yeah, and I think some of that has to do, too, with our, with our banking institutions here. I mean, they're, we have a, a plethora of large banks and community banks that you know, really are filling every little niche that we've got, I think, for, for home ownership or renters. And um, while it, it obviously is not 100% where we want it to be, um, I think we've got a lot of choices that make it easier for people to make that transition. Speaking of uh, seniors and renting, uh, number five in the country and senior, being senior friendly, according to this particular survey, cost of living, as access to health care, yeah. number of senior properties, yeah, the healthcare part of it is huge. Access to healthcare is almost in every senior measurement that comes out from a quality of life perspective, the most heavily weighted part of it is access to healthcare. I wonder why we're so uh, fortunate. Well, we've got two medical schools here and three major healthcare systems that continue to grow and continue to provide services and the resident foundational doctors and offices around that. So I think we're, we're just blessed with a really robust medical community. You know, we are relatively low cost compared to some other places. And so for, for seniors, that's, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you can live here reasonably well. So, um, but the, the medical piece is a, a big part of it, I think. So we're going to head into the fourth quarter here. Um, anything on your mind regarding the immediate future for the end of this year? You know, we're, we're in the midst of trying to plan for next year based on what we accomplished this year and what our five-year strategy wants us to look at. But, but I think there, there's some... Um, you know, some big pieces that we're going to see continue to grow. So the Riverfront Development Project is going to continue to come out of the ground, so to speak, and we're going to continue to see progress there. Like in 2020? 20, 21, it actually, the, the first phase of it actually will open in the spring of 21. That's not that, long, that's not that no, far from not. there. The ConAgra campus is going to go through a huge metamorphosis starting late this year, probably December or January when they start taking down um, the old uh, corporate headquarters and start extending Harney Street into the old ConAgra campus and start extending 8th and 9th Street into the campus. so More old market feel? Yeah, and it's going to be a true, I mean, another entertainment district right on top of Very this cool. marvelous riverfront project, which is right on top of you know, the capital district, which is an entertainment district. So, I mean, there, there's this robustness about what's happening in, the, in this market for construction, all the way from what... Uh, Paul Smith's doing um, behind the hotel row, as I like to call it, uh, where he's building, taking these warehouses and building cool office spaces and startup spaces, all the way from there, all the way south to uh, really up south of that, that kind of agri campus. The whole riverfront there has just been remarkable. And it's going to be really exciting to see over the next few years. Very cool. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Happy o holidays. Always fun. Same to you. Thanks. Appreciate it. David Brown with our quarterly talk, uh, chat about economic development and everything regarding the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce, third quarter business, and we'll get together again after the first of the year. Thank you for being with us again on MCC TV. Our goal is to better acquaint you with the mission, leadership, and the reach of the college. I'm Kent Pavelka for Metropolitan Community College.